satellites that are up in space don't have the ability to plug into the ground system. They have to have entirely self-contained power because you can't stretch a cable up into space. And besides, the satellites are moving way too fast. So they have to have the ability to either launch with power or or have the power that um, they can generate uh, while they're on on orbit. So we're going to talk about how a satellite generates power, how it stores power, what are some of the requirements, and what are some of the other features of the power system that are typically covered. So the two main ways that spacecraft are powered is either through solar panels, such as a, on the left is the International Space Station, or through a radioactive thermal generator. Now these are usually not placed in Earth orbit. There are some on the moon, um, and there are some on Mars and a lot of the, older, the outer solar system. But uh, these radioactive thermal generators use radioactive heat decay in order to produce the power that's needed for the spacecraft to work. And the solar panels obviously use solar energy to generate that same power. Now, for a very, very short-term satellite, you might only have a battery that doesn't recharge. And that can be perfectly okay if you only need to operate for a day or two. The very first satellites, that's all they had. So Sputnik was a, a short-term battery. Uh, there is one other system that's a, worth noting that has been talked about and uh, has actually been used a little bit. You can put a full-blown nuclear reactor in space and operate it. This particular mission is called the um, Jupiter Icy Moon Observer using a Prometheus um, uh, reactor engine. It, you can see this is a huge ship much, much larger than we typically send out and has a lot more power. These are actually used to cool the spacecraft. They're not to power the spacecraft at all because it has so much more heat from all of the systems that can run. This can run way more power than your typical system can, and thus it can use uh, electric engines that are more efficient, and it's a pretty neat system. Uh, we have not really made extensive use out of nuclear reactors for a number of reasons on orbit. Main reason tends to be because of the fear that's typically associated with nuclear products. Although this would be very low risk because the reactor would not turn on until after it had left the orbit of Earth. And before the reactors turn on, there's very little damaging particles that could could affect it. But it was a very expensive mission and it was canceled. And in some effect, it was uh, part of the Juno mission that's currently in orbit around Jupiter. Although that was vastly scaled down. So this is an example of satellite batteries. Now you need batteries on the satellite to do two things. First of all, to power you when you're not seeing the sun for whatever reason. And the second reason is um, if you have like a radioactive thermal generator or a satellite that for some reason absolutely never goes into shade, you might have some points where you need a little bit more power than others. And by having batteries, you can, you can make that work. Excuse me there. So how much batteries do you actually need? Um, there are two key events that happen in a satellite's life that are important as respect to the battery capacity. The first one is very common and it's important to happen for, for all spacecraft uh, that ever go into eclipse, which is the vast majority of satellites, all Earth orbiting satellites will at some point in time be behind the Earth. Or if not, then uh, they're in a very, very unusual orbit. Maybe a sun-synchronous orbit at sunset or something might not, but most of the time they need it. So you need the power to be able to withstand this eclipse period. And this is an example of what one of these power curves might look like with just a couple of sample plots. You want to have enough power such that your batteries can be fully charged before you go into eclipse and then come down. Now notice this is actually only 80% charged. Why is that? Well, your batteries are on orbit and they need to last for a very, very long time. And so, you know, if your cell phone uh, 
one of the main components that goes out in a cell phone is the batteries. They might only last two years. And, you know, two years, you might only be getting 70% of the charge that you started out with. And that's no good. So what satellites do is they've studied the batteries because they, they need to last for 10, 15 years. They studied the batteries and they figured out how to make them work absolutely optimally. And the key thing, it depends on what kind of battery exactly, but the key thing typically is to not completely charge them and not completely discharge them and to control the rate of how fast you charge them. Because heat, too much heat is damaging to a battery and if you charge it too fast, then it can heat up and that can cause problems. Now, the exact parameters for each of those depend on the battery type. So look into the batteries that you are using for your spacecraft to figure out how they, they need to work. And you can figure that out. Um, geosynchronous orbiting satellites, they typically don't go behind the Earth very often, but the, they do around spring and fall. And they can actually be behind the Earth for about 70 minutes. This is a typical low Earth orbiting satellite, a 100 minute period. So that might be eh, 750, 800 kilometers, something like that. The second one is at launch time that determines how much of a battery you need. So on the right here, we have the schedule of a Falcon launch. Now there's one event that is very important that is not in here. And it happens about T minus 13. It depends on the mission exactly. But it's um, all systems going to internal power. So at that point in time, the satellites go to internal power, meaning they're no longer being charged. They're, they're typically being charged even while they're sitting there on the launch pad, and even while it's still loading fuel. They want to hold that off as long as they can. So once that happens, the spacecraft is still running, but it's running in a special mode where it's waiting to to be pushed off the spacecraft. So it's it has sensors that are sensing it's on the spacecraft and it's looking for those. So that does take some power. And because of that, there's a limit to how much time they can be. Now typically they will charge the batteries fuller when they think they're going to go through a special event where they will need it more. And one of those kinds of events is at launch time. So at launch time, you will uh, be needing to, to do that. You might charge them even to 100% completely. You can't do that very often because it will limit the lifetime of the batteries. But this is one point in time where you would certainly want to have that extra power available. Now, it could be on internal power for 13 minutes is the low end. It might be longer. Uh, notice here, and one hour and 12 minutes, the Iridium satellite was deployed. So this has been on internal power for an hour and a half. And then it takes some time to deploy the, the solar panels. It takes some power to do that. And then it also has to orient itself towards the sun. All of that can take some time. So the batteries on the spacecraft also have to be such that they can make it in time to to uh, deploy everything and still have plenty of margin. And what happens if this deployment happens right as the satellite's about to go in the sun? Well, you know, you might have two and a half to three hours of time where you're not getting any kind of power at all, which could be bad news if you don't plan for it. So they plan for the absolute worst case, putting all of this information together. And that's how they determine how much the battery needs to be. Now, typically, you'll have some sort of a curve such that if the battery level goes too low, then the satellite will enter in some kind of a safe mode where it turns off some of the excess components that don't need to be on. Maybe the, the payloads might turn off or turn down in power and scientific instruments, and you go just to a pure engineering mode, and you wait for further instructions so that the engineers can take a look at the satellite and figure out what's going on. One other thing that's important for satellites is they have the power to control all of the subsystems independently. So this is a training unit for the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see each one of these little wire bundles, they could control the power to a different section of, of the spacecraft. So, you know, you might have... Um, relays to control how much power is going into the batteries. You might have 
different payload systems that you can turn on or off, different boxes, you know, all of the boxes will at some point in time need to be able to be turned on or off. And so that's an important thing too, to be able to do that just to power cycle them if they're malfunctioning. And uh, more sophisticated systems, they'll have backup systems so that way you can still operate the satellite even if you're power cycling one of the, the sides of it. Anyways, thanks very much for joining me. Let me know whatever questions you guys have about satellites, about the power system in particular, or anything else that's on your mind. Thank you very much for joining me on this journey. And until next time, keep on tracking. Take care.